right. All right. Hey, everybody. Hey, Talk Universe. We are at the end of another week, and uh, this is my new weekly review session. I figure it's a whole lot easier to acknowledge everybody and thank them all for coming on the podcast if I do a weekly week in review and then tag as many people as I possibly can Seemed to work out very well. Last week was a record-breaking week because I think I had 13 or 14 interviews. This was a great week. I just uh, completed the last of eight interviews yesterday and today. Uh, Thursday is always my big day for interviews, and uh, I found that I, I generally swap it. I go from Thursday to Friday. And then some weeks I go from Wednesday to Thursday, and, and this week was a Wednesday to Thursday week, and it was absolutely a blast. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go through all of the talks and summarize them for you. And uh, actually, I want to encourage you if, you, if you have a question for me, uh, I'm open for questions because I'm not interviewing anybody right now. Uh, I want to kind of loosen up about the don't ask questions when I'm interviewing somebody on Facebook Live uh, because I'm finding that we often do have time for one question, maybe two questions after the uh, interview is over. Um, just so that you know, when I invite a guest to come on the podcast and uh, take us behind their talk, I have 40-minute blocks for generally a 15 to 20-minute interview. And so what I try to do, and, uh, and I divvy that up, I try to bring the person up to speed. I don't know the people. They don't know me. So it's a little bit to just, uh, you know, hit the record button right away. I do not do that to people. Instead, I try to get to know them a little bit, try to put them at ease as best as I can. And now, um, if they are video, I, I try to get them on Facebook Live. Uh, and and uh, all the video people, I believe, have uh, agreed and acquiesced to that uh, very cheerfully, which is great. But I, I try to make it nice and safe instead of completely freaking the people out and hijacking them. And that, that is not what I want to do at all as an interviewer or as a human being. That would be a horrible, horrible, horrible thing to do. So I try not to do that. But I only have about five minutes, maybe ten minutes uh, that I allocate maximum really of 10 minutes to try to work out any tech bugs. Sometimes, you know, there's a Skype connection, disconnection thing, and we have to start over, or, you know, all of that. So I try to hold that to 10 minutes and then at the 10 minute mark or before get into recording the interview and then maybe have 10 minutes, maybe five minutes if I go long or maybe less than that if I go long to actually, um, uh, wrap up with them. And that's really all the time that I get with my guests. And many of my guests, really all my guests, uh, really enjoy talking with them. And I just love to stay on the phone with them or on the, the mic with them for another hour. But they don't have the time. And, and frankly, I don't have the time, especially when I've got 11 people in a row like I did last week. So uh, that's a little bit, in case you're wondering, what, what in the heck are you doing, Nathan? And, and how do you have all this stuff set up? And what the heck is, is going on? Or what, what is the deal, Nathan? That's a little bit of, of the reason why. So if you want to ask a question, go ahead, type a question in. I've been a little bit restrictive about that just because I don't want to, frankly, I don't want to be distracted because I've got all kinds of, there we go, Rich, my neighbor, my college neighbor, always a good person to, uh, uh, to, to count on for a question. What's real? Hey, man, this is real. 100, I got to say this, 100 interviews as of yesterday on Be The Talk. So this was a real milestone week. Uh, you know, hey, Rich, man, can you imagine, you know, 20 years ago, we're in Cutter Hall, which is the worst name for a dorm room. Why did they stick us in a room? You know, do you ever think about that, Rich? We go to college. And they stick us in a, a dorm dormitory called Cutter Hall. That, that just doesn't make any sense for a music school. That's not what you want to be doing with, with your music students. Hopefully uh, somebody has donated even more money and they've renamed that, that dormitory. Oh, my gosh. Nathan Cook, Trouble in the Air. 
trouble on the air or trouble in the air? Because I live in Philadelphia, and there was that tragic thing that happened yesterday. I am very thankful that, uh, uh, well, first of all, very sad for the the woman who who passed in that horrible thing that happened. On the other hand, I'm very, very happy that the other 150 people on the plane were able to safely land, even though they were in distress. And I have mixed feelings because I, I think yesterday or the day before I booked a, a uh, flight on the same airline, uh, probably the same type of jet. So I don't know what that comment is all about, uh, uh, Nathan, because I don't know if it's on the air, if you're having trouble with me on the air. Uh, in which case I might have trouble with you on the air. Uh, it could be mutual, of course, uh, or trouble in the air. There has been a lot of trouble going on. And I'm not going to talk about Starbucks down the street here in Philly because that has been buzzing everywhere. And I, I'm just, I'm just going to, yeah, I'm trouble. <laughs> I'm trouble. Okay. Hey, Tim, it's good to see you, buddy. Hey, back in the day, man, I, I miss having you as a co-host. My gosh, yeah, 100 interviews is awesome. All right, so you guys rock. Uh, let's jump into uh, Lest I Bait and Switch You here a little bit. Let's talk about some of my phenomenal guests on uh, Be The Talk. And in case you are wondering, hey, what's the deal? Why, why, you know, what's the podcast all about? Well, it really is for anyone who is a professional, anybody. You actually don't even have to be a professional. You certainly don't have to be a speaker. You just have to be a person who's passionate about something. And uh, there there are branded talks out there. I call them branded talks because you've got Q ideas, you've got Idea City, and then you've got the big daddy of the whole bunch, which are TED, and it's localized, uh, democratized uh, half-brother or half-sister TEDx. And uh, so there are a 100,000 of us TEDx alumni out there who have given – our talks. And it's really, uh, I, last week I talked to Kathy Armias, who is uh, the organizer of TEDx Portland. Her interview dropped today. Her bonus interview drops tomorrow, where I ha have her take off her speaker hat and put on her organizer hat. And so uh, she is the first organizer that I've brought on. TEDx Portland, uh, from what I have heard, is the largest TEDx in the world. So I was just amazed. I, w I was not expecting uh, her to be the first uh, organizer that, that I was able to bring in uh, to a, a upstart podcast, little tiny upstart podcast with only 100 episodes out there. Actually, only about 80 episodes are live. Um, I have 130 interviews lined up at this point or another, including the ones that I've already done. So we just started. We're a seven-day-a-week podcast, and we have a small team that helps me get these things out. But the idea is to give you the tips, tools, and techniques that you need to be able to easily, more easily, more skillfully uh, be able to spread your ideas. And the reason that Kathy comes in is she gave a great distinction that, you know, the TED platform, really any of these branded talk platforms are idea spreading platforms. They're not here for, for me to walk on the stage or even you to walk on the stage and impress us with how great a speaker you are. I mean, that's great. And, and you know what? You need to be a good speaker. You need to develop the skills to be a really good communicator of your idea in order to successfully give a idea, a talk that really is an idea worth spreading. The good news is I've seen many people, I've been in the room with many people who did not consider themselves speakers, but they worked on their talk very, very diligently, and they landed that talk, and they made an impact in the room. And that is a magical feeling, and it's just really, really uh, awesome to be able to see that. So the idea with this podcast, uh, it's not, uh, and and I, you know, a lot of people say uh, they try to they try to get me to 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 say that I'm a, a speaker coach or something like that. I'm really not accepting any clients or coaching clients or any of that stuff. I'm not doing this for that reason. I want to build up a repository and a body of work so that somebody can go and binge listen on their commute as they're trying to think about how am I going to apply to get accepted so that I can give and spread this idea. I want to shortcut a little bit. I 
I want to I want to close that gap for them so that they can more skillfully, more knowledgeably, and more efficiently and effectively be able to go from not even knowing what your idea we're spreading is to finding that idea to know how to go about applying and then to get behind the driver's seat and be able to leverage from the power position, not being at the mercy of of the different organizations that they apply to, but rather to put themselves to sit in a place of being in charge of the situation, which really means diversifying, which really means uh, not putting all your eggs in one basket and then getting accepted and then finding the right person to work with to really be able to hone their ideas so that they really land uh, that talk. Just as uh, uh, that that's basically the idea behind all of this. I haven't taken the time to really spell that out because this is only the second weekend review that I have done. So I wanted to take a little bit of time to do that. Now let's talk more importantly about the people that I talked to this week who are just absolutely brilliant people with ideas worth spreading and um, just pulling down my uh, spreadsheet right here. Okay. 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 Here we <laughs> It's like when you when you've talked to a hundred people, sometimes you have to scroll a little bit longer to find the the right people on there. So I did something a little unusual this week. I started the week in a deficit. So this is a seven day a week podcast. I started out this week. I only had six people scheduled for this week, and I had a goal of increasing the amount of uh, bandwidth that I had. And I think I had another maybe 30 people scheduled for an interview when I started this week. At the end of this week, so many people wanted in. I'm out all the way to 50 days out. So I achieved a, a goal that I thought was going to take a lot longer. Very happy. In order to do that, I started reaching out to people in different arenas, including LinkedIn, uh, and uh, bumped into my new friend and Philadelphia. She's on the other side of Philadelphia in the Bucks County area, Mary Fran Bontempo. And so she was awesome. She gave two recent talks, neither of which are live yet. So she's been doing this so recently. She she gave two talks in the span of a month, which is uh, not something that I recommend for everybody. But if you're Mary Fran Buntempo, uh, you can handle it because because she got a, a pretty high energy level, pretty high determination. One of them was called uh, Surrender Dorothy. The Power of Giving It Up, and the other one was called Ending Our Addiction to Awesome. And so she shares about some family challenges in her life as she was coming into, uh, and she's written a book about not ready for granny panties, which is just kind of a, a real funny uh, title of a book, gives you an idea a little bit about her personality. And, uh, and so her talks were a little bit related to that. She hit a spot in her life, as she shared on the podcast, where there was a lot of really serious stuff, a lot of serious challenges, a lot of stuff from left field, uh, and particularly in, in her family that, that were just challenging her and her coming into new seasons of life, uh, as you can tell from the title of that book. So she gave these talks, and, and she took us behind the talk to give us some of her lessons learned about all that. So we had, and, and I think Mary Fran, you know, now that I've done 100 interviews, very, very succinct, very sound bites. It was, she was keeping me on my toes because it's like I had to really, I had to really elevate my, my presence in the call so that I could ask a appropriate and mindful question because she would just say like five minutes in about 30 seconds. <laughs> she was so succinct. So uh, she really kept on my, on, on the toes. I'm really happy to feature, um, you know, Philadelphians. Um, she joins a, a small handful of other local folks here on the talk, and it was just awesome. Then after that, we talked to uh, Salvador Acevedo, and he gave a talk called I Am Mestizo. Now, what Salvador does is he goes into boardrooms, he goes into corporations, and he really helps them integrate, and he helps them. I mean, really, what happened here locally in Philadelphia with the certain coffee chain and some of the the um, the controversy and some of the things that they're doing, which uh, pretty much across the board, people seem to be saying this is heroic. It may not be enough. It probably a lot of people are saying it isn't enough because you, you can't just have one-off training 
uh, on things, but that's really what Salvador does. He goes into boardrooms and he helps people integrate, do market research, and he helps people be able to take people from different cultures and be really, really inclusive and develop effective strategies to be able to serve those people uh, and, and for brands to be able to serve their customers, not just in the customer land, but also in the boardroom with employees and, and diversity and, and multiculturalism and all of that. And really his point was that he's not, he's not a, um, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say this right, but it was kind of like he is completely integrated. He's an integration of all of these wonderful cultures. And, and so he's able to embody all of these. He's not a mix. He's not a blend. He is a, a conglomerate. And he brings the best of all of these different cultures was was basically the gist of, of that interview. Sometimes when you do an end of week recap, you get a little fuzzy in the head. And some sometimes with some of these sensitive topics and the events of the week, uh, if you're not really careful, you, you can uh, go a little fuzzy on your memory. So I want to be careful what I say. But, I mean, it was a great interview. And, man, what a, what a timely interview uh, with some of the things that are going on this week. Then, for my next interview yesterday, I talked to Kelsey Wedding, who is a veteran of the Miss Pennsylvania stage. Uh, she was talking about um, uh, she was talking about um, anxiety disorders, and so she had in her talk, which is called "Mental Health Conversations in the Media." She did an excellent job of pointing out where we we talk about or we allude or you have euphemisms about mental illness on TV shows and sitcoms and just in general the media, and we oversimplify or we make light of these very, very, very si serious things that really 50% of people are, um, or I maybe I think 50% of people, there's a high percentage of us that deal with hype, you know, extra level of anxiety. And so her whole point of her talk is to share her authentic story. It's a very brave story. She's extremely courageous, shares her journey, uh, shares some of the real challenges and hurdles that she has overcome along the way. And, uh, and it's just a great interview uh, with, with Kelsey Wedig. Um, yesterday about that. So, uh, and then we talked to Laura Pritchett, uh, which was a real fun interview as well, because she has a kind of a kind of a, a, a fun sense of humor. I almost want to say a wicked sense of humor, but I'm not going to say that because that that may be a little too far. But she wrote a book. Her most recent book is about uh, death, and so uh, her her talk was called "How to Record Silence," and she wrote a uh, like a handbook about death. And I've talked to uh, other people on the podcast about bereavement and how to deal with grief and, and all of that. And in general, I think we've talked about on, on the podcast, we've talked about that subject a lot. And when I look and, and see how much people are engaging with, with that topic, it's a little lower than other ones, probably because it's, it's kind of hard to keep the energy level up when you're talking about, you know, death. But, uh, Laura is not your average uh, speaker. She's not your average guest on a podcast, and we had a, a little bit too much fun on that episode. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I was starting at one point, uh, my guard completely, my filter completely went down, which I'm not super uh, happy or proud about, but I started talking about Monty Python episodes where they were kind of laughing at death and talking to death and, and death kind of physically shows up and they weren't really being very respectful about death. And of course she had seen that skit. And so we went off on that a little bit. It was a good skit for, or it was a good uh, interview for bunny trails as well as underscoring the original point about how to, and, and her point is prepare and be prepared and think about how you want to go. Think about your. She talked about a death mantra. Now that's not praying to dead people or any, you know, anything like that. It's instead, you know, what what are you know, if if you know, an object is hurling towards you, what what are you going to say in that moment? Is it help me, God, or I'm ready, Lord, or or ah, shoot, you know, or a bad word or whatever? I mean, we we've all got something that comes to mind. 
her point is why not be proactive in figuring out what you're going to say so that you can be a little bit more uh, prepared if that may be your uh, time. And uh, and another really good point that I know from personal experience uh, uh, about 10 years back with, with, a, with a grandparent is uh, to be, you know, it, to, to try to communicate before the time your wishes so that everyone, so that there can be no surprises uh, if it is your time, uh, all of that. And, and so if there's not much communication, then there's probably going to be a lot of concern, elevated uh, emotions, all of that. And there's probably going to be some infighting uh, around your family because you didn't communicate. But if you do communicate and you take out the surprises, you give them an opportunity to hopefully come together if it's something that that is not a surprise, something that they can prepare for and, and be present for, then then you can have a you know an easier transition. Okay. Isn't this great having, you know, be the talk podcast where we talk with with other people who gave a TED talk or a TEDx talk or a branded talk. And we talk about these sometimes very taboo subjects and we can do it in a way that while not being disrespectful, we can have a little bit of fun with it. That's the idea. Now, yesterday I talked with um, Marshall Shepard yesterday, who has a show on Sunday nights on the Weather Channel. And I had no idea because, I mean, some people I talk, you know, some people have, you know, different size bios, and I do watch the talks and I try to do my research. But if I'm interviewing eight people or 14 people in a week, uh, sometimes I get caught a little bit off guard by surprise. Now, Marshall Shepard is the head of the meteorological department at the University of Georgia. And uh, and so he's the, he's the head of that department. He's in that department. He's doing really great work, but he's also advised and briefed professionals in the White House, in Congress, in NASA, the Department of Defense. I mean, he's done some really, really high-level stuff. And he jumped, he's one of the people I reached out to earlier in the week just on LinkedIn. And before I know it, he's, he's booked for that Wednesday to, uh, to talk with me. And so that, was, uh, that took me a little by surprise that he had that extensive of a background, so I'm interviewing him, and uh, really that was a great interview. Any of you that are in, you know, really high level consulting roles, you're going to love that interview because I ask him at one point. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking, this is this is great, and then I'm also thinking, what can I really ask that's going to add the most value? So I'm not even talking, you know, meteorology or the weather channel. I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about. This man has a gift and an ability that is honed to be able to simplify, to appropriately simplify very complex things for very, very busy, high-level people. He's, a, he's the ideal consultant for other consultants. So if, if you do that, if you have to brief very high-level people in a very, very absurdly short amount of time, uh, the questions that I ask Marshall are really going to help you because uh, he's right there in that boat. So uh, he had some great answers for for us as well. Uh, so I believe Marshall may have been my 100th episode. Right now I'm really on the fence because I was thinking about doing a special 100th episode and maybe bringing on some guests and I'm thinking also at, at the same time, I'm, I'm tempted. I've got so many people waiting for interviews at this point. I may just fly right by that and wait until we go to maybe 200 episodes or maybe 250 episodes before I really uh, uh, make a big deal out of it. Or I may just get too busy and we'll, we'll just fly right on by. Uh, or maybe I'll, I'll incorporate these end of week uh, Facebook lives for that person, uh, for that person. For that purpose, a little bit. Now, uh, before I move on, I'm going to um, uh, take a little detour here because I upgraded my rig a little bit. Not my recording rig, but I got a new camera this week. This is a uh, 930 a Logitech C930 camera right here. And really what this does is it actually rock, it widens my view. So if I was on my MacBook Pro camera, You'd only see to about here, 
And now this gives you like 180 widescreen, really widescreen. And apparently it's a good microphone, but I'm not, not, not as good as this one that I got. And uh, the other thing that I did is I got a ring light. I got a 14-inch ring light right behind me. So if you look into my eye when I don't have my glasses on, you got this gorgeous little little hypnotic ring going on in my eye. And if I am rude enough to put my glasses on, it doesn't look doesn't look quite as flattering. But you can you can see it going on right there. Yeah, uh, and I can kind of hypnotize you with my my bad glass glare right there. All right, so we upgraded the rig a little bit. Nothing but the best for you, Talk Universe. I'm putting you first, okay? This is this is professional stuff. I am getting my act together because my equipment is more professional than I am at this point. I'm going to have to interview another 100 people to hone in my craft, my newfound craft. You know, God gave me the radio voice. Okay, God gave me the radio voice. Can't take credit for this. I'm just trying to to enjoy this and highlight other people, make them the hero. Try to be a little bit of a guide, especially if you want to give that talk or maybe your next talk uh, to change the world. And it is some really important stuff. All right, so we're going to continue on here. So we had uh, one person on Tuesday this week. We had three people yesterday, and then we had another uh, we had four people yesterday, excuse me, and then we had three people today. So if I had my druthers, and I may have my druthers, I think what I'm going to do in the future after I have another 50 people or 30 people in addition to the, the 50 people I already have in the queue, uh, I think at some point I'm going to try to have fewer days that I interview and just have more back-to-back people just because that, that really puts me in the zone. It's really a lot of fun. As the team grows, I can't wait to have someone, not not just automated autoresponders and calendar software, but I'd love to have someone to actually manage my schedule and move things around so that we can just have so many back-to-back people in there, not because I want to pack them in, not because I want to leverage myself like a hero, but instead so that we can retain this energy zone that I get a little... Uh, get a little woo-woo here about the energy, but there is some energy. I get really, really cranked up when I do these interviews. I get really, really cranked up. You can hear it when I get to talk to amazing subject matter experts as well as people who are not necessarily subject matter experts, but they really have great ideas, and I am helping them blast out their ideas some people are out there, you know, they gave a, a you know, they really wanted to be a, a TED speaker or whatnot, and they worked really hard, and they did their 50 hours preparing for it, and then they did it, and they did a good job, and then where did it go? And now it's in the past, and they're not getting the views, and if they want to get more views to their talk, they have to, you know, run all these ads, or they have to try to promote it and all of that. I've learned that a lot of people are not really good at promoting myself included. And so I think it's a whole lot easier to have somebody else promote you. I think it's a whole lot easier instead of our current administration uh, that that is uh, able to self-promote very, very well, but with mixed reactions from people, which sometimes uh, is part of the brand there. But I, I think it's great to be able to promote other people. I think it's great to bring somebody on to help position you in a way where you can just kind of be that default de facto expert because you're being asked questions. And so people know that just by nature of people tuning in to listen to what you're saying to answer questions, you are a expert just by the nature that somebody out there, it's almost like is if, if nobody's in the woods and a tree falls, does it make a noise? Well, if you know, it doesn't matter if somebody's watching live or not. If if you're being asked questions and you're answering that questions, are you an expert? Well, yeah, you absolutely are because you're answering questions. And at some point, people are going to come across that content and that material. And as long as they stayed clued in, then they're acknowledging that you have something to say. And that is powerful positioning. So I'm realizing all this stuff. It's very, very interesting. It's kind of the philosophy of... Uh, of being asked questions or the philosophy of an interview. It's it's really, really interesting. So one interview on Tuesday. It was very diluted this week. 
four interviews yesterday and then three today. So, like I said, I was underrepresented this week at the beginning of the week. I only had six interviews, at, which is a net loss of one day, which is unacceptable. So I reached out and a bunch of people had eight interviews by the end of the week, by, by the middle of the week, actually scheduled, which is great. So I've got seven days this week, eight interviews. I'm up one, which is good. And I've got a lot more interviews next week, which is going to be great. Might be a record sec- setting week again next week. I can't wait. So today came. All right. Who did I talk to today? I started out with Kale Burke. Now, this is not a vegetable kale. It's kale with a C. He's from Canada. And he is a, what was his, where is his bio over here? He is a district principal of innovation. That's his real title in British Columbia, Canada. A district principal of innovation. So we had a fabulous, I mean, come on, people. I've got, I got a master's degree in instructional design. Okay. I used to, I used to adjunct professor instructional design. So I, I'm an expert in instructional and curriculum design. I'm bringing on a innovator design principal and we're talking about Maslow. We're talking about, uh, Gardner's multiple intelligences. We're talking about you know, whether there really is a difference like they told us years ago between pedagogy, the training and the teaching of children versus andragogy, which is the, the teaching of adults. We don't really think there's that much of a difference anymore. We think kids are getting so sophisticated, so self-directed, so unique. The technology is allowing them to express themselves in such a unique way. Why not harness that? It's really an andragogical approach almost instead of pedagogical, which says, oh, tell the children how to do it and give them a little bit of customization, but basically it's because I said so and assumed that, that they don't need to be self-directed. Now, I'm, I'm being a little bit uh, I, maybe not fair to that theory, but that depend, you know, compared to andragogy, when you teach instructional design how to influence grown adults who have bills to pay, and responsibilities in their sandwich between their kids and their elderly parent. I mean, you better tell the, the adults what's in it for you, what's in it for you. This is what we're going to learn. This is the objective. This is what you're going to get at the end of this. This is what you're going to be able to do. And then they can step up and do it. And you don't have to lecture them for four hours. And if you do try to lecture them, they will drop your course or they won't complete the training or whatever, and, and they shouldn't because they're adults and they got responsibilities. So it's on our responsibility as learning designers to be able to design a better program. Now, we didn't get into that level of minutia, uh, important minutia with Kale, but he had some great ideas. He was a really fun interview. Check out his interview in about three to four weeks when it is live. Uh, I think I think I Facebook lived uh, his interview. I think I may have done that. I can't remember with uh, certainty whether I did or not. I hope I did because it was a great interview. Next, we had uh, Rico Garcia. He gave a talk called "Growing Money in the Desert," and it was really about. Uh, it was very uh, reminded me what what they're doing in Israel um, uh, in the desert, and they've used their technology to grow things in the middle of the desert. Uh, and that's really what his talk is about, is based basically multi-purposing uh, mesquite uh, trees, which are all over kind of random in a, in a very kind of desolate area in South Texas. And there's a way that they're exploring, and there's investors now to be able to do that in a way that, that is able to be harvestable and grow uh, beneficial crops out of these trees that are that are normally uh, not not valued very much. So that was a fun episode, and, and he wrote a very interesting book about a goat that ran successfully for office in South Texas, and we, we talk about that a little bit. Now, uh, most recently, up to the present, the one some of you might have seen this, uh, Bruce Friedrich, and, uh, man, what a great interview. Now, this was, and I told him so, this is a textbook interview. If you want to learn how to influence other people. If you want to learn the leadership principle of being able to influence other people who may not agree with you and find common ground, Bruce did it. Because Bruce's talk is all about how he used to be 
uh, a, a kind of a, a these this is my words, not his, but kind of a moral activist. He used to lead on the causes that he felt very passionate about, which is uh, has to do with animal rights and and food and food sources and the sustainability of all that. And he used to lead with the moral or, uh, argument about how we treat animals and we shouldn't eat you know animals. We should all be vegan. All of that. Now, if you agree with that, that's great. If you don't agree with that, if, if somebody is, is very passionate about that, there may be a little bit of resistance. If you like burgers, okay, and his talk was amazing because what does he start out with? Big picture on the big slide and in his hand walks out into the crowd eating a burger, okay? So he's got it right there, talks about his background growing up and in the Midwest and very sounded like a very rural, very traditional kind of background. And he loved burgers and, and he just takes us in to his story and then leads us and influences us. And, and our walls are down because we're like, you know, I can relate to this guy. I like a burger too. And then we find out why he doesn't eat burgers anymore. And, and we find out, well, ha- yes, he does eat burgers. They're just not made out of like animal meat. They're made out of, uh, clean meat, and this is how that works. And then you're still like, well, I can't imagine that that works. In the interview, he starts talking to me about soy milk, which I've been drinking soy milk for the really the last 15 or 20 years now because dairy milk just kind of it would just kind of got me, you know, got got me a little, um, you know, just kind of got in my system, and I would run and and it would just not be the best thing for me. So I switched over to soy milk and coconut milk and, uh, you know, all, all of those different kinds of milks. And I, li- I actually prefer that. And meanwhile, the price has gone down. Meanwhile, it's 10% of milk. Um, and it's not the vegetarian or, you know, uh, little niche. It's the mainstream niche. And so it's very interesting and the perfect analogy on how really smart people instead of, you know, just kind of strong arming uh, the rest of us against our will, they're using their influence to connect on common ground. And then when you think, in, in my case, you know, I actually prefer almond milk or coconut milk or uh, rice milk or or that. And I, I almost never drink uh, dairy milk at all. And it's the same thing with these sources of new clean meat. So, Go figure. And then he and then he said that the the hamburger or the or the burger that he had I can't I, I don't know that I should call it a hamburger but that was a TGI Fridays burger and it was a clean burger and uh, apparently must have smelled good it looked good uh, just a brilliant talk and so out of the hundred people that I interview I gave Bruce the award the impromptu award for finding common ground on an otherwise very emotionally loaded topic because it's emotional on his side because he has very, you know, very strong feelings about animals and ethics and all of that. And then it's a strong feeling on on other people's side. And I'll, I'll put myself on that side because it's like I don't want some person telling me what to eat and what not to eat and how I'm a horrible person, I, you know, even though I like TED Talks, okay? Even though I watch TED Talks, I still don't want somebody coming over to me and telling me I'm an awful person because I don't believe or think the same way that, that they do. And he sidestepped that whole thing brilliantly. So he gets the award uh, for all of that. All right, friends, that is the wrap-up of the week. Uh, uh, it looks like nobody is writing any more comments, unfortunately. Uh, it looks like no one at the current time is watching anymore. And you know what? That's okay because I'm going to have this video on YouTube and I'm going to post it in the comments where you can watch the recap double speed as always. Because you know what? I love you guys. I don't want to waste your time by not giving you speed controls on your media. Can you ever think about that? How You know, if you can't, like, if somebody doesn't give you the option to download whatever their lecture is or whatever, then you're stuck listening it in in single time instead of one and a half or double speed. Or, you know, often I'll do two and a quarter speed the the first way out on the app. I can actually do quarter speed increments because I'm 
geeky like that, and I save a lot of time, and I, I'm able to to get through a lot of other people's stuff. I get through a lot of my own stuff. Actually, I listen triple speed to my own stuff because I know what I already said. I just need to be reminded of what I said, and so that's uh, <laughs> that's what I do. All right, you guys, I'm wiped out. It's been a good week. I've got an amazing uh, weekend this weekend, welcoming a new family member this weekend. So, uh, yeah, uh, all I'm going to say about that, I am so excited, and I'm going to be the talk this weekend because I'm going to be emceeing uh, the reception and the rehearsal for that. So I'm going to be honing my skills and uh, walking that uh, balance between – just a, maybe a gentle roast of of my little brother and uh, and and loving on him and, and doing an appropriate job at uh, at doing some emceeing. So uh, I'm I'm walking the walk, I'm talking the talk, literally, and so are you. I'll see you next time and join us on a Facebook Live uh, as I'm going to be definitely doing more and more of these things, especially since I got the audio to work for my guests. Take care, everybody.